So I'm um, currently getting my doctorate from Fuller Seminary in California. And I remember on the first day of the class, our professor wanted us to go around and introduce ourselves. And so the first person who went was a student named Johnny from New Zealand. So Johnny gets up and he said, I'd like to introduce myself a little bit differently and I want to use a traditional Maori introduction. And the Maori, as many of you know, are the indigenous peoples of New Zealand. So Johnny starts to introduce himself and I cannot possibly replicate um, how he did it, um, but he, essentially he said something like, I honor the God of heaven and earth. I honor the mountain Taranaki. I honor the river, Oreti. I honor my ancestors. And then he named his particular tribe. I honor my grandfather and my grandmother. And then he said their names. I honor my mother and my father. And then he said their names. And then he said, I honor my wife and my children and said their names. And then the last thing that he said was, and my name is Johnny. And he went on to explain that unlike Westerners who start with themselves and their own names, that the Maori are not individualists. They see themselves as part of something much bigger than just themselves, um, the whole of creation, in fact. And if you say, as a Maori, that I honor Tana, Taranaki Mountain and I honor the river Oreti, then others would be able to place you in, a, in that context and say, yes, I know that mountain. I know that river. I know the ancestral tribe that lives near there. You are not this lone individual adrift in the universe by yourself, but you belong in and to a landscape and a history and a lineage that includes your parents and their parents after them and their parents after them that shape and define who you are. And it was just this really beautiful and moving introduction. So I unfortunately had to go right after Johnny because I was sitting next to him. And so I got up and I said, I honor the island of Manhattan. I honor the Empire State Building. And I was, of course, uh, kind of joking. Um, but there was this part of me that just deeply resonated with Johnny's introduction. And, you know, while I may not live near the mountain and the river that my ancestors in Korea um, have lived in, um, I am not a lone individual adrift in the universe, and neither are you. We belong to this landscape and a history and a lineage that is so much bigger and more meaningful and more enduring and more glorious than our individual lives. And that's what our passage is about this morning. So the lectionary readings um, in Advent um, give two weeks out of the four weeks to this strange figure of John the Baptist. And he is mentioned by all four writers of the Gospels, which means he's important. And they're saying that the good news of Jesus Christ is inseparably bound up with this forerunner to the Messiah. So John the Baptist, if you Google images of him, he's always got the same kind of look. Like his hair kind of looks like Bon Jovi, if you remember Bon Jovi from the 80s, or um, the Beast from uh, Beauty and the Beast. And it's all kind of crazy looking and jaggedy, and he's really gaunt and eccentric looking. He's wearing camel's hair. You know, Mark says that he ate locusts and, and wild honey. And he looks like someone who clearly could care less what anybody thinks about him. And in the other Gospels, um, he's also talking about judgment and fire, and he calls the Pharisees, brood, you brood of vipers. He's not the kind of person that you think that people would gravitate towards. And yet, Mark tells us that the whole Judean countryside and all the people of Jerusalem were going out to him and were baptized by him in the River Jordan, confessing their sins. Why? The people recognized that he was part of this larger landscape of Israel's salvation history, and by extension, ours, that had deep implications for their world that was tied to the actual landscape, the wilderness. So first, the landscape of salvation history. 400 years earlier, the prophet Malachi wrote, Lo, 
I will send you the prophet Elijah before the great and terrible day of the Lord comes. He will turn the hearts of parents to their children and the hearts of children to their parents, so that I will not come and strike the land with a curse. So this Elijah that Isaiah and the prophets are talking about, um, they foretold of this one, this voice that would be crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord and make his path straight. So for the people of Israel who heard these prophecies for, for hundreds of years, they knew that this forerunner of the Messiah would stand at the frontier of the old age of sin and death and bondage, and that he would announce the dawn of the new day of redemption and restoration and healing breaking in. And so they recognized John as one who was firmly ensconced in the landscape of this history. Not only a watchman, but the watchman who was on the walls of the city after a long and dark night. And that he sees not just a light, but the light of dawn, the light of the Messiah breaking into human history. And so he appears in the wilderness. And he's proclaiming this baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. As um, Fleming Rutledge writes, she says that when Elijah comes back, the next person who shows up will be God, and it will be the first day of the age to come. And when God comes, you best be ready. And so John the Baptist was this Elijah announcing this future that was coming. And he recognized this even as a baby in the womb. Like, do you remember the story where Mary goes to visit John's mother, Elizabeth, who was miraculously pregnant as well with John? And she says to Mary, as soon as I heard the sound of your greeting, the child in my womb leaped for joy. Why? because he knows that the Messiah has come to free his people who have been enslaved for thousands of years, whether it was to the Egyptians, the Babylonians, or the Persians, or also, or and also, enslaved to sin and to death. Long lay the world in sin and error pining till he appeared and the soul felt its worth. When Elijah comes back, the next person who shows up will be God, and it will be the first day of the age to come. And so you best be ready. And that's why, secondly, the actual landscape of the wilderness that John is located in is so significant. So the wilderness is where the people of Israel encountered God in the Exodus as they wandered through the desert those 40 years. The Lord had said to Pharaoh, let my people go that they may worship me in the wilderness. And the wilderness, the glory and the power and the loving care of God is seen like nowhere else. You know, in the wilderness, you have to depend fully and utterly on the Lord for provision. The harshness of the wilderness purifies you. It does not per perfect you, but it sifts you. You know, separating out the wheat from the chaff in your life. The wilderness is the place of repentance, a change of life, a change of heart, a change of mind, and it demands the whole of you, your whole heart, just like that hymn exhorts us, let every heart prepare him room. Because you know what? There are some not so pretty things in the room of our hearts. There are idols that we cling to and disordered loves in the room of our hearts. There are mirrors that we are addicted to looking into in the room of our hearts. There are beasts of resentment and unforgiveness and hostility towards our enemies roaming around in the room of our hearts. There are things that have been rotting for years in the room of our hearts that have never been cleaned out and so John is that voice that's crying out, saying, prepare the way of the Lord. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley shall be lifted up, and every mountain and hill will be made low. The uneven ground shall become level, and the rough places a plain. Then the glory of the Lord shall be revealed, and all people shall see it together, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. 
I have baptized you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. In the Gospel of Matthew, it says he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. And it's that fire of God's presence, that holy love that burns up anything that is not from him. And these images are saying that when God comes, that everything changes. And so in this Advent season, where are you and I in this landscape? This pandemic has been a wilderness of sorts, hasn't it? And it's exposed not only our hearts, but the heart of our society. And it's not lost on me that when the word of the Lord comes, it doesn't come into the temple, it doesn't come into Caesar's palace, but it comes into the wilderness, into the margins, to the lonely, to the barren. If the wilderness is the place where we encounter the living and loving God, how can we let this season be a time where our feet are firmly planted here, where we don't run away from the wilderness or hide, but let God come and allow the Holy Spirit to do that landscape changing work in our hearts of raising up the valleys and removing the obstacles and making those uneven places level so that God can find an even place for his feet to enter into our hearts. Where do you and I stand in this landscape of salvation history? Well, the theologian um, Jürgen Moltmann said that the believer is not set at the high noon of life, but at the dawn of a new day, at the point where night and day, things passing and things to come grapple with each other. There's only one John the Baptist, and yet we too stand in this lineage of watchmen who take our place in this Advent landscape of our world where night and day and things passing and things to come grapple with each other. And maybe the little area where your feet are planted in this landscape is at home, you know, as you raise your children, or maybe in our schools where you teach other, pe other people's children, other people's children, and the many voices that are vying for their hearts and minds that cause them to question their worth and their identity and their belonging are constantly echoing in them. And you are there to say you are loved, you are valued, and you matter. Maybe the little piece of the landscape that your feet are planted on are in these places of power, boardrooms and corporations and, and law firms where that culture of power and wealth and influence and the bottom line rules above all else and you are called to be light and salt there. You know, maybe where your feet are firmly planted are in the margins, you know, where you or where others are hidden and unseen and neglected by society. And your very presence there says that God sees you, God knows you, and God loves you. And to be the hands and feet of Jesus in that place. And wherever it is that your piece of landscape is, no matter how big or small it is, that's the piece of ground that the God has given you and placed you on to take up your position and to stand firm like John the Baptist, to announce the good news of Jesus Christ to point to the one who has come and is coming, Jesus the Messiah. That is the prayer of our hearts. That's the Advent prayer, is come Lord Jesus, and to allow him to enter in to this Advent world that we live in and to usher in the new creation, the new heavens, the new earth, and that begins in us. And so pray that prayer with me, come Lord Jesus. Come, Lord Jesus, come, Lord Jesus, be our light in the darkness. Amen.